today we're continuing to talk about this uh, topic, how to grow spiritually, how to grow spiritually in our lives. And as we do, I just want to say uh, uh, hello to everybody who's joining us right now online, whether Facebook Live or YouTube or whatever uh, other means, whether you're wor worshiping with us on this Sunday or at another time tomorrow, uh, as of this morning, of course, it's Memorial Day for us, and it's a day that we've selected as a nation to, to honor those and to mourn those uh, who've died in our armed forces. And you know, it's always, as a, as a preacher, kind of on Sunday before Monday, it's always a kind of a sobering uh, day to just reflect on the fact that we're here today and able to enjoy the freedoms that we have and to enjoy all the things that people are going to be enjoying this weekend because some people aren't here and because some people who paid an incredible sacrifice of their very life for that. And it's just, it's good to just stop and remember. Uh, but also, just as a, as a pastor, to, to have, you know, the text of Scripture before us and to think about that, you know, when we're talking about sacrifices and we're talking about, you know, giving up our life, it's, it's just kind of hard not to also just think of, take for a moment and think about what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Knowing that he was going to come into this world and knowing that he was going to give up everything for us. You know, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that, that he died there for us. He died not because of what he had done, but because of what we would do, and he would take our place. And so, you know, as we, as we think about all of that this, this, this morning, a word that, that sort of comes into my mind is, is an old word for this is the word steward. You know, the word steward means a, a word of the sty, literally one who takes care of something that belongs to somebody else. And, you know, we are stewards of our freedoms. We're stewards of our responsibilities. And it's interesting to think about that word today because of the passage we're going we're gonna to come to here in Mark chapter 4. Jesus is talking about how to grow spiritually. He's sitting in a boat. There's a crowd of people who gather there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and he's just telling this story about a farmer. He goes out, he throws some seed, but he's not talking about seed. He's talking about God's word. And it lands in different places, and some people are good stewards of that word, and others aren't. As Jesus tells the story, some falls in some places, and birds come and eat it, and he'll explain the word of God comes to some people, and it just it's like in one ear and out the other. There's no absorption. There's no responsible handling of it. Others, he describes, as, as sort of having, a, having shallow root systems, and they don't really have a, a sustainable growth plan in their life spiritually, and they don't last very long. And others grow roots, he says, but they never grow fruit. There's no, there's no bearing fruit in their life. And so the question, in a way, as we come to this fourth chapter of Mark's gospel, is are we going to be a good steward of what God has to say to us? Are we, going to, are we going to take his word as we should and handle this responsibility and freedom as we ought to? And to, and to kind of unpack that, what Jesus does is he tells two very, very brief stories, two very short parables to explain the parable that he just explained. And this is what it says in Mark chapter 4. We're going to pick up reading in verse 21. Jesus said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? I kind of want to stop there for just a second and just kind of tell you some things kind of interesting in the text. So our English translations are always trying to translate it in a way that we can really get it, but they, but they don't translate this passage as it is actually in the original language, which is to say that in the original language, the sentence, the subject of the sentence is lamp. In our Bible, the, 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 it becomes the object, because that makes sense to us in English, but in, but in Greek, when Jesus said this actually in Aramaic, he, what he really said was, a lamp comes under a bowl, does it not? Meaning, no, it doesn't. In other words, the sentence's subject is lamp, but actually it's also not a lamp, in, in the original language, it is the lamp comes. The lamp or the light has come into this world not to be hidden, not to be concealed, not for no one to see it or to be, experience it, but in order for it to be visible. 
And Jesus is not talking about just any old lamp. He's talking about himself on the, on, sitting in a boat, casting the word out to all of us 2,000 years later. And the question is, 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 did he do that so we wouldn't know or did he do that so we would? Does, do you bring a lamp in to put it under a bowl? Or, instead, he says, don't you put it on its stand? And that negative question has an obvious answer. No, that, that's what you do. For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. And then he says this. This is his second parable. He says, consider carefully what you hear. And I think it's also interesting the way the Bible translators handle this, this, this sentence because in the original language, all it literally says is, see what you hear. See what you hear. To see, now just kind of think about that. How can I see what I'm hearing? How can I see what I'm hearing? Well, what Jesus is saying is, listen, I don't want you just to hear what I'm saying today. I want you to be able to visualize, comprehend, and understand what I'm saying in a way that you can do something with it. So the translators say, consider carefully what you hear. Don't just hear this, really think about what it means. Understand what I'm saying. He continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is kind of one of those cooking kind of metaphors, if you will. But what's interesting in the, in the text is he says, it will be measured to you. Now we call this the passive tense. And the question is, is if it will be measured, it will be measured by whom? In the original language, as we translate our Bibles, we call this a divine passive. Meaning that the passive is being used here deliberately because Jews did not want to pronounce the name of God, the sacred name of God. So it will be measured to you by God. How you handle the word you're hearing and what you do with it, you will be judged by the Almighty for how you deal with that. And then he goes on to say, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. You got the word? You're going to grow and produce more. But whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away, like the bird stealing the word from the path. So that's the stories, but what, what does this have to do with how to grow spiritually in our life? Well, Jesus is describing how we're supposed to respond to this, and we're supposed to be good stewards of it. And so let's take the first, the first one and just see how we can make sense out of it. This, this first parable is all about lamps and lights. And so let's, let's say it like this, that a good steward reveals the word. A good steward casts light, shines a light on the word. And so let's read it again. This is what Jesus says. Just a short passage. We can read it again. Mark 4, 21. He said to them, do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Now, when we, we see this word lamp in the Bible, um, the, the word actually is, is used quite interestingly and quite commonly for the word itself, for God's word. The God's word is a, a lamp. In fact, um, one of the most famous Psalms, Psalm 119, uh, which also happens to be one of the longest Psalms, those of you who love to memorize scripture, um, go home and <laughs> try on Psalm 119 for size. Because all the way down around verse 105, we get this. Your word is a lamp. What's interesting here is the word word in the Bible sometimes is just a word in general, but sometimes it's used for all of God's words, what they called in Hebrew the Torah. We call it the law, but that's a misnomer. The Jewish people did not think of their book as a list of rules. They called it Torah, which means the guide of life. It's, it's how you walk about your spiritual life, how you're directed. And so in Psalm 119, 105, when it says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path, it means your word is what guides me. Your word is what directs me through this dark world of misinformation. 
It's your word that is a lamp. Now, let's just think about this for a second. If we have a lamp, and this is an old oil lamp, archaeologists, when they dig in this part of the world, they find, they find these oil lamps more commonly than any other object. I mean, I know they would like to find gold coins because that would be really valuable. What they find are these worthless oil lamps because that's what people use to bring light. But he, he says in this psalm, it says, your word is a lamp for my feet. That doesn't mean that you hold the lamp down around your feet. If you were to go out somewhere in the woods or something and, and it was dark and you had a flashlight and you're trying to find your way, you would not hold the flashlight right down here at your feet. Because if you did that, all you could see was your feet. When he says your word is a lamp for my feet, you, what you do is you hold the light up and the light creates a perimeter, a circumference. It creates visibility so that you can see beyond your feet. You can see what's beside you and in front of you and that way you're staying on the right path. Well, his word is described here in this passage as doing that. It reveals, it brings, it gives light to. You know, uh, our nation went, began its great revolution in 1776, but America wasn't the only place that was involved in revolutions. In the late 1700s, France went through what they called the French Revo uh, Revolution. Prisoners during, the, during that time were, were put into prisons. As many as 40,000 people would die in these French prisons. And when you got all the way to the very last prison, you were, you were kept in this prison in, in, in Paris, in, in Paris Conci La Conciergerie, which was a prison of about 2,000, where about 2,000 people could be kept. And as you were taken out of it, you were taken to the guillotines and you were killed. And this is this bloody, horrible revolt that took place. It's called the Reign of Terror in French history. But when some of those people were put into one of these particular in one of these prison cells, I think we can actually show you the picture of what this prison cell looked like, one of them. Uh, th and they were crowded into, into, into some of these. Somebody brought a copy of a Bible. Now, you know, they say that there are no atheists in foxholes. And I would imagine that in these prison cells, there weren't a lot of atheists either as people were going to their death. And they probably were reflecting a lot and wanting to hear a lot about what God's word had to say. And this man had a, had a Bible the problem is, is the cell was dark, and there was, no natural, there was no artificial light, there was no lamps, there was no lights, but there was a little sliver of light that would come in from the very, the very uh, top of the ceiling, uh, natural sunlight, for just a few moments every day. And so the prisoners in this crowded cell devised a plan whereby they would stand on each other's shoulders and lift the man who had a copy of the, of the word, and he would hold it for the moments that he could in the sunlight. And when it would go away, they would bring him down, and then they would gather around him, and then this is what they would say. Tell us now, friend, what did you read while you were in the light? Isn't that a great question? You know, we think about our world today, we kind of see, folks, it doesn't take a lot of spiritual insight to know that our world's in the dark. A lot of people are in the dark. And you know, the people who, who have the word, that have the seed of God's truth, I mean, that's supposed to be us. And we're the ones who today have the opportunity to experience it and, and to share it. And they might, this world around us might be saying to us today, tell us, friends, what did you read while you were in the light of God's word today? What, what did you learn while you were in Scripture what did you learn while you were in church, in Bible study? What did you learn? Share with us that, that word, that light. The word, a good steward, reveals the word. Now, another way to say this, and it's the way Jesus describes it in the second parable, is that a good steward is a, a responsible witness. We use the word witness to describe somebody who sees something. So does the New Testament. In the Bible, the word witness is the word martyr. It's a person who, who is in a trial, and you see something, and you testify about what you've seen. You see it, and you put it into words. You explain what you saw. So listen to the way Jesus describes this in Mark 4.23. He says, anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Let them hear. Consider carefully, or see what you hear. 
With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. From them. You and I are stewards of what's been given to us. We, we have a responsibility. We will be held accountable. And so we need to not just hear, but we need to listen. If you have ears, listen. This expression was very common in the ancient world. Uh, not just by the Jews and the Christians, but even by the Greeks. There's a famous Greek Stoic philosopher who lived 2,000 years ago. His name was Epictetus, and he famously said, we have two ears and one mouth, therefore we should listen twice as much as we speak. <laughs> That's great advice, isn't it? It's the kind of thing that we probably heard someone say to us as a kid. You know, you've got two ears and one mouth. You know, why are you talking so much? We like to be heard. We like our opinion to be expressed. But we live in a time where a lot of the information that we have and a lot of what is said really isn't either accurate or helpful. And we live in a time when we desperately need to hear the truth. We need to hear God's word. And so we ought to spend some time listening carefully. Speaking of Greek philosophers, maybe none more famous than Socrates, uh, the Greek famous Athenian philosopher who, like Jesus, gathered to himself students. Uh, you know, in the, in the Gospels, we call Jesus' students disciples, and that word literally means a student. That was the way things went in the ancient world. You didn't go to a university, take a class with some unknown professor, and have a quiz afterwards. In the ancient world, philosophers, teachers, would gather students unto themselves and you lived with them, you followed them, you, you didn't just learn their information, you looked at all of the elements of their life and you, and you tried to emulate that. You lived among them. But it came in the Greek schools, in the Greek universities, with a fee, you had to pay tuition. And one young man, wanting to be the student of the great philosopher Socrates, they say, came to him and, and asked uh, if he could be a student of his and to be trained in the classical art of oratory, to learn to speak publicly and persuasively, something the Greeks love to do. But then the young man went on to just talk incessantly to this great philosopher. He just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And, and finally, the philosopher Socrates stopped him and he said, young man, I'm going to have to charge you a double fee. I'm going to have to teach you two lessons. And the first lesson is you're going to have, I'll have to teach you how to speak eloquently and powerfully and clearly. And the second lesson is I'm going to have to teach you to shut up and listen. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point, isn't it? I mean, we sometimes, when we're sitting on the shores of Galilee, and the one who is speaking has the source of all truth, he is the bastion of of knowledge. He is the revealer of divine information. He is the only ray of light in a world of penetrating darkness. We need to listen. We need to use our ears. And so Jesus says, if you've got them, seeds going out, the words going out, if you got them, use them. And don't just hear what I have to say. Consider carefully. Don't just hear it, see it. Understand it. Put it into practice in your life. Now, the other way Jesus said this, and I've waited till now to share this with you, is when he says this same thing in Matthew's gospel. It's the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount. And it happens at about the same moment in Jesus' ministry and career. And he says it like this in Matthew 5, and you're gonna, you're gonna pick up on this immediately. This is gonna sound so familiar to you. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. We're all like, oh yeah, this is what he's talking about. And then he says this, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. That's what he's talking about here. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, we don't just hear it, we don't just see it, we do something with it. We're a, we're a steward, we're a responsible witness of it. Vance Havner, famous preacher, once said, the gospel is not something we come to church to hear. 
It is something we go from church to tell. We didn't just come here today to hear the word, gather around, shake a hand, sing a song. We, we didn't just come here for that. We came here so that we could be empowered to then go out and be that witness for him in this dark world, to be that ray of light. Tell us, friend, what did you see when you were in the light? I've, I've shared through the years, the, I think, the compelling story of a man whose job, not very glamorous, was to operate an elevator in Nashville, Tennessee. And in the elevator, he would share his faith with people. And I, I've always kind of jokingly thought to myself, he, he, you know, somebody would go in there and he'd say, like, do you have claustrophobia? You know, I run, I run the opera. Do you want to know Jesus? You know, uh, I don't think he did that. But he did share his faith with people. And he, once, once somebody said to him, you know, how can God use you? And, and you know, what kind of important job is it that you have? And he said this. And it's a very famous, very famous response. He said, I am just a nobody telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. What he says there is actually really true, isn't it? Historians of the ancient world and, and the rise of Christianity have picked up on something really interesting. And in fact, I, I wanna tell you this because there's already probably some of you that are here, maybe some of you watching, they're thinking, yeah, we need to be responsible witnesses, we need to tell people about Jesus, but, but preacher, that's kinda your job and we just kinda get to do what we wanna do. Like, like you do that, you're the preacher, you do the preaching, you do that, but we don't need to worry about that. But actually, when you study the history of the early church, you discover something very interesting. Early Christians started out as just a few handfuls of people in an upper room. On Pentecost, there were about 3,000. By the end of the first century, there were thousands more. By the end of the second century, there were tens of thousands. By the end of the third century, Christianity had become the official religion of the Roman Empire. How in the world did this tiny little group of people influence literally the entire world? And somebody said, that it must have been some great orator, there must have been some great preacher, there must have been some great philosopher, some voice of the Christian faith that convinced everyone to be Christians. But historians have noted that for 400, for 400 years, the Christian church had no great preacher by rhetorical standards. The first was John Chrysostom. Yet, during those centuries, Christianity conquered the Mediterranean world by the faithful witness of the common believer. It was every day ordinary Christians like you and me just being faithful stewards of the word of God. It spread from just a few until it encompassed the entire world. That faithful, bold witness stands out for us. Because we, we do have a responsibility with it. You know, the, the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament, he lived during one of the most difficult times in the story of God's people Israel as the Babylonians would conquer and destroy the city and their, their leaders would be taken away into captivity and all these horrible things were happening. But, but the big problem in the book of Ezekiel was that Ezekiel was telling the people the truth and there were a bunch of false prophets that were making up lies. And the prop, false prophets were saying, hey, folks, there's nothing to worry about here. Everything's going great. Don't listen to Ezekiel telling you you need to do something different. You got coin in your pocket. You're okay. Nothing to worry about here. But God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel, and he said, Ezekiel, you're like a, you're like a watchman on a wall. And you stand there, and you watch if you're doing your job, you see an approaching army and you warn the people and everybody can be, make their defense and the city can be saved, but if not, the city can be lost. This is what it says in Ezekiel 33, eight and nine. When I say to the wicked, when I say to the sinful person, you wicked person, you will surely die and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin. And I will hold you accountable for the blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though yourself will be saved. 
You are faithful to bring the word. It's up to them to respond to it, but you still have to be faithful because you're the watchman on the wall. You're the steward of this word. I talked about this last year. I don't know if anybody remembers last year because of COVID, and, and as I was preaching through this series called Find God, um, you know, it was all recorded and that sort of thing, but I talked about the different ways in the New Testament people share their faith, how they do evangelism or share their witness. And not everybody does it the same way. I told you about the example of Peter, who was very confrontational in his approach. I told you about Paul, the intellectual. I told you about the blind man in John 9, who he said, I don't, I don't really know who Jesus is. All I can tell you is, I once was blind, and now I see. And that's sometimes the best way for us to share the gospel, is just to tell somebody, I can't tell you everything about Jesus or the Bible, but he changed my life. The Samaritan woman, I told you about her in John 4, who met Jesus and she went to the village and she said, come and see, <laughs> could he be the Messiah? Come on, come to church, come to Bible study, come, let me show you what I found when I was in the, when I was in the light, come and take a look. It's one of the most powerful, effective ways to share the gospel. I told you about Matthew, when Jesus met him, Levi, the tax collector's booth, he just said, hey, follow me. Sometimes it's as simple as that. But I also told you about a lady named Dorcas. And she's in the book of Acts. It's just kind of a little verse about it. It doesn't say much about it. It just says that Dorcas did this nice stuff and people became Christians. She, she did things for people. We call it service evangelism, where you help somebody, you do something. I was thinking about that the other day. I got to finally go to the hospital. You know, they finally cleared pastors to go to hospitals. And I saw one of our, uh, one of our church members who was really sick and uh, I walked in the room and she just started telling me a story. She said, she was so happy to see me. She said, Pastor, I want to tell you a story. I, there, I, I've been at First Baptist Church almost my whole life. And uh, when I was in one of the most difficult times of my life, my family had come apart, my life was really just in disarray. She said, um, the church came through for me. And every night, church members would bring food. They, they formed a, a line of people bringing food. And she said, we never went without. I, I didn't know how I was gonna get through day to day. And she said, but one of my family members saw the incredible compassion and love of the church. And she decided that she wanted to become a Christian. And I said to her, I said, oh, I'm so glad you just told me that. I have this great sermon illustration. And she's like, well, I've got some more. I was like, no, 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 that's good. That's good, right there. Just keep it right there. I got all I needed right there. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? Some of us in this room could say that. We've been through some tough things and Christians came through for us. Hey, listen, the reason I'm saying that to you is you may say, I don't know if I can do this witnessing thing like this. Maybe God didn't make you to do it like this. Maybe he made you to do it like this. Maybe you don't do it confrontationally or intellectually. Maybe you do it through your acts of service, through helping, through caring, or like we did yesterday, just feeding the hungry in our community. However we do it, we need to be good stewards of this word that's been given to us so that we can grow spiritually, not just roots, but fruits that make a difference. Let's pray. Father, this is such a wonderful passage of scripture. and The temptation for us today, God, is just to kind of hear it and go, this is, this is really good stuff, and then just kind of in one ear out the other. But God, this sermon doesn't do any good it stays in this room or stays in a living room. God, it doesn't do any good unless it goes out these doors, out into the streets, unless it has, a, has an afterlife that leads us into Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday in which our life becomes a living witness of Jesus. So God, I just pray right now as we just kind of finish this sermon and we go into this time of worship. God, may your Holy Spirit just speak to each heart, each life here today. Maybe somebody is here and they're hearing the word for the first time and they need, they need to put their faith and trust in you. They need to put their life in you. They need to accept this message and, and begin to follow you and to become a Christian. Or Lord, maybe there's some folks here today that they've got some stuff in their life that's just distracting them from what needs to be there. And right now is a moment of redirection. Or Lord, maybe there's some of us that's just been kind of sitting back on our laurels kind of content, kind of living in the comfort zone of the Christian life, if we can call it that, God. And today you're just calling us out. You're calling us to step up and to step out and to live our faith, to help people 
who were in the dark to see what we found when we were in the light. In Jesus' name.